The book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 1, is where we begin today. This is our, let's see, this is our twelfth study in 1 Samuel. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to this word that we're about to read. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies for battle and were gathered together at Shokah, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched camp between Shokah and Azekah in Ephes Damon. The Philistines are at it again, and they got beat up pretty bad last time. The Philistines are not stupid, so I don't think that after their last defeat, that they ever thought they could pull off a win against Israel under normal circumstances. However, I think they may know that there is a rift between the spiritual leader in Israel, Samuel, and the political leader, Saul. It could be. And they know that division weakens any nation just like division weakens any home or any team or anything a house divided against itself cannot stand Jesus said verse 2 and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched camp by the valley of Elah and set up in battle array against the Philistines and the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span Goliath was nine feet nine inches tall his head could just about reach a basketball hoop on an NBA court and Saul, the king of Israel, has been tormented. This man, he has had a very sinful self-focus. And it has driven him to the point of being insane, almost. Plus, he is being oppressed by demons. And now the Goliath thing. But you know what? Goliath is probably one of the best things that could happen for Saul's mental health at this time because it's going to take his focus off of himself, which is always a good thing. It's one of the worst things anybody can have is a self-focus. Verse 5. And Goliath of Gath, excuse me, and he had a helmet, Goliath had a helmet, of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass Goliath's coat of armor that he wore was approximately two hundred pounds his clothes probably outweighed David's body by an awful lot six and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a buckler of brass between his shoulders and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him Goliath's javelin was several inches thick with a 25 pound iron spearhead imagine toting that thing around and trying to throw it and not only that he had an armor bearer walking ahead of him with a big shield the guy looked like a tank not a human a big tank verse 8 and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them why have ye come out to set up in battle array am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul choose you a man for you and let him come down to me and I would think 
that if King Saul does not answer this challenge himself, then he ought to be embarrassed. He is the king. He is the leader. If no one else is going to do it, then for sure as the leader, Saul should be out there doing it, or he ought to be dying trying to do it. You know, if this was David, if David were king, his soldiers would have to hold him back. He'd be out there. Verse 9. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. It is simple, says Goliath. Winner take all. Well, that sounds simple. And that sounds logical. There's only one problem. War is not simple like that. It is dirty. It is bloody. And as long as a nation has an army with a chance of winning, they're probably not going to throw down their weapons simply because one of their soldiers gets beat. So this whole thing is just a waste of words. Verse 10. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Goliath thought an awful lot of himself and the Israelites and their cowardliness was making him even more arrogant. And so with each day that passes, Goliath gets more bold and the Israelites more fearful. Verse 11 when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You can tell the Holy Spirit left Saul because he has no boldness. He has turned into a coward. And the people are also afraid. And that makes sense because if a leader does not lead in righteousness, truth, and boldness in the Holy Spirit, chances are the followers won't be any better. 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem Judah whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons and Jesse went among men as an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. David had played his music for the king. We saw that last time, in the king's court. But that did not make him proud, or make him feel like he deserved special treatment. He kept a level head. He would play his music in the king's court whenever needed. Otherwise, he was home in the field taking care of his father's sheep as usual. David was humble enough to do whatever needed to be done. And no honest work is beneath the dignity of God's people. 16. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. Goliath is having a good time strutting out in front of the Israelites twice a day. He is really playing the big shot in front of his fellow Philistines and in front of the Israelites. Verse 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge David had played music for the king he has been anointed as the future king himself we saw that last time but to his family, he is still little David, the errand boy. 
the youngest in the family, little David the workhorse. Sometimes the least likely people to appreciate a godly person are the members of his own family. David's family did not appreciate him. We saw that last week. There was no respect for him. And we're going to see it again in a minute. Verse 19. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And what I like about David here is that he made sure that his sheep were cared for before he took this journey. His visit to the battlefront was important. It was more important than those sheep that he was caring for. But they were his responsibility. And so he took care of them. He made sure that somebody was watching over them. A godly person is not an irresponsible person. 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and was shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had set up in battle array, army against army. And here you have a military standoff. Neither one of them are taking the first swing. Instead, both of them are sizing each other up. And here comes David. God's timing is perfect. He made sure that David showed up at the exact right time. He made sure that David would be in the right place at the right time. God always does that with his people. It's time for God to showcase his chosen man, David. Look at verse 22. And David left his baggage in the hand of the keeper of the baggage and ran unto the army and came and saluted his brethren. David leaves the supplies and runs over to the battlefield to see what is going on. David was enthusiastic about Almighty God and about what was right. Verse 23 And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines and spoke according to the same words and David heard them David gets his first look at big arrogant Goliath and David isn't going to like him very much here comes Goliath he comes out as usual eager to renew his challenge Goliath is very confident he thinks he's on the road to victory. He does not know that he is on the road to destruction and death and hell. And many people today are in the same situation. Many people today think they are on the road to heaven, but they are on the road to death, destruction, and hell as well. Anyone who does not have God through Jesus Christ but has confidence in their future, confidence in eternity, has a false confidence. Just like Goliath. Verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The Israelites are afraid. There's only one explanation for it. Their faith in God is not what it should be because God has handled bigger challenges than Goliath on behalf of his people much bigger but they are afraid and they don't want to challenge this guy and sometimes people do not want to do what God wants them to do because they just don't want to do it rebellion sometimes they want to do what God wants them to do but they are afraid 
But there is never a good reason to run from the place where God wants us to be. He would not want us to be there if there was not a purpose. Verse 25 And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man who has come up surely to defy Israel? He has come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Goliath was a giant. Nine feet, nine inches tall. Don't know how big Saul was, but remember he was at least a head taller than any other Israelite. Israel wanted a king, they said, who would go in and out and fight their battles for them. This is Saul's big chance. But the Holy Spirit left Saul. So he didn't have the courage to do what he should have been doing. Instead, he tries to buy the services of others. But there are certain things that God wants us to do. And we cannot sell our personal responsibility as Christians to someone else. Christianity is not a spectator sport. We all have a part to play. 26. And David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man who killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man who killeth him. And so while others seem to be more interested in the reward for killing Goliath, David was outraged over the fact that a pagan could dare Israel and get away with it. David resented the fact that God's people and even God himself were being insulted by this heathen. Some things are beneath the dignity of God's people and some some things are beneath the dignity of a child of God and they ought to outrage God's people 28 and Eliab his eldest brother heard when he spoke unto the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and he said why camest thou down hither and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness I know thy pride and the willfulness of thine heart that for thou hast come down that thou mightest see the battle you know Eliab gets all ticked off at David because David says why is this Goliath fellow being allowed to get away with this and his brother David's older brother gets all ticked off that's because Eliab did not have the guts to fight Goliath himself which I suppose made him ashamed and now he's really embarrassed because little brother David is talking tough and he will fight Goliath and he exposes his own cowardliness by his bravery so Eliab Eliab gets angry he would evidently rather see Goliath mock Israel and mock God than have David go out there and defeat Goliath that's a classic self-focused person a self-focused person would rather see God dishonored than have someone else get credit for putting a stop to it 29 and David said what have I now done is there not a cause only the youngest child in a large family could really understand I think what David was feeling here what have I done now is what 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 have I done to deserve to be yelled at this time there there, isn't there isn't there a cause here am I not right and he was right David had right on his side and he had truth on his side and that's why he stood firm is there not a cause you don't have to back off when you know that you have truth on your side when it's backed by scripture 30 and he turned from him toward another and spoke in the same manner and the people answered him again in the former manner and so David is receiving opposition from those who should not be opposing him and we should not be surprised 
if we are opposing evil and find ourselves opposed by the ones that we thought would stand behind us to do what is right we must be ready to persevere through the threats of the enemy and even through the indifference of friends sometimes who should be standing behind us verse 31 and when the words were heard which David spoke they recounted them before Saul and he sent for him and so Saul remember he offered a reward for bait for anybody who would go after Goliath and kill him and he thinks he might have a bite consequently he sends for David David has been angry over Goliath not just afraid like the others and when you are angry at evil when you are angry and disgusted with sin more than you are afraid of any repercussions for taking a stand for what is right you are at the point where God can use you verse 32 and David said to Saul let no man's heart fail because of him thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine David loved God so there is nothing to think about he doesn't have to think about he will fight that giant because he loves God there's nothing to think about when you love God like David did life is very uncomplicated when your biggest concern is pleasing the Lord who redeemed you you don't weigh different things in the balance you just do the right thing 33 and Saul said to David thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for thou art but a youth and he a man of war from his youth Saul thought David like some people I suppose had enthusiasm young people especially had a lot of enthusiasm but not a lot of sense not a lot of wisdom that's what Saul is thinking because after all Goliath has been fighting for almost as long as David has been alive and so Saul is clearly judging according to outward circumstances leaving God out of the equation completely David on the other hand knows God and therefore he knows that if he goes out and fights Goliath no matter what the odds may be Goliath is a dead man 34 and David said unto Saul thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth and when he arose against me I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him no wonder God wanted David to be king he put his life on the line to rescue an innocent lamb from wild beasts and he will take care of God's people too not use God's people like Saul did the lives of God's people will be important to him and the blood of God's people will be priceless to him 36 thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God David's tough enough to do the job he has proven that he is brave he rescued lambs and destroyed the beasts that tried to kill them and now he will rescue the Israelites from Goliath and also make sure that Goliath is never a problem again 37 David said moreover the Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine and Saul said unto David go and the Lord be with thee if God gave David the strength to defend his sheep then he will sure give him all that he needs to defend God's honor and God's people as you recognize and give thanks to God for the little things that he has done or for the things that he has done for you in the past as David recognized what God had done for him in the past you will be better able to believe him for bigger things today and in the future verse 38 and Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head also he armed him with a coat of mail 
I suppose that this was nice of Saul. I mean, he was doing what he thought was best for David, giving him his armor. Saul was sincere in the help that he was attempting to give David, but he was sincerely wrong, that's for sure. Notice verse 39. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he attempted to go, for he had not tested it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David put them off him. Saul's armor fits Saul. It fits Saul just perfect. But it doesn't fit David. Which just goes to show that what is right for one Christian, what works for one Christian, does not necessarily work for another. And we cannot, we should not even try to force a child of God into our own little mold. Let the Holy Spirit use other Christians in a way that is tailor-made for them. 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had even in a pouch and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. David was going with what he knew. He stuck with what he felt comfortable with. And it worked out fine, as we will see. And the lesson for us is this. Do what God wants you to do in a way that is right for you. In a way that is most natural and comfortable for you.